Elvis will be coming back, and the impersonators are merely his prophets. Got a whole lot of money that's ready to burn, so get those stakes up high. Not alive, you say? He still manages to bring home $75 million a year, and recently opened a new restaurant serving his favorite peanut butter and banana sandwiches. Fried. His career seems only slightly hampered by his death. This week, they're celebrating the sale of his one billionth record, more than anybody else ever. And there are enough Elvis impersonators around for the Teamsters to organize. And fans are here in record numbers. They want to see Graceland, of course, but increasingly, they want to see everything. These two German fans saw where Elvis first made love, and they met Bernard Lansky, who sold Elvis's wild duds, and now sells them to fans. They want what Elvis had, and this is what Elvis had. He is great. He is still the king. CBS will have more about the Elvis phenomenon, plus a story of real life. On Elvis, Steve? Well, Sylvia, they say Elvis is dead, but from the looks of things here at Graceland, you might not think so. There are thousands of people here to visit the home where the king lived and died. What's become an annual pilgrimage to Memphis has turned into something much more. Elvis was great, uh, his music, everything. Here, there are people from all over the world. Before this weekend is over, there will be many kind words and many fallen tears, all in honor of the king, whose first number one song, Heartbreak Hotel, ruled the charts in 1956. I've been so lonely, baby. I've been so lonely. I've been so lonely. I could die. <laughs> Right here is the Billboard Book of Top 40 Hits. It also ranks the top 100 artists of all time. Based on the number of his hit songs and the time they've spent on the charts, Elvis is ranked number one with over 8,000 points. The Beatles, number two, have about half that. To relive the magic, people here are taking home all the souvenirs they can. As one woman put it, anything to relive the memory of the man who changed music in this country Later tonight, the mood here will change considerably. A candlelight vigil is scheduled to start after the sun sets and continues through tomorrow morning. I'm Steve Lusinsami in Memphis. Joel, now back to you. Thank you, Steve. Enjoy it. Yeah, startling development uh, then, and it's even more moving and memorable to many people uh, today. Thousands of his fans will be here tonight to show that all over again here at Graceland. His was a death in the family to so many strangers. At Elvis Presley's Graceland gravesite, once again, flowers and fans line up in memorial tribute. He just grabbed everybody the same way and said, come along with me, we're going to have some fun. And I think that's what the world needed then, and I think that the world, that's what the world needs now. You ain't nothing Right from the start, he stirred passion, for better or worse. It's shocking. I watched him gyrate his legs and swivel his hips. And our parent-teachers group feels he should not be on television. Millions disagreed. His unique mystique endures. Who impersonates Jimi Hendrix, John Lennon, Kurt Cobain? Elvis just had that certain something that I, I don't know that any of us can explain. Good evening. Elvis Presley died today. He was 42. His death was classical tragedy, hero felled by his own foibles. Every year on this day, candlelit crowds grieve at Graceland. I have cried more in the last two days over Elvis than I have in a long time. Tonight, ritual repeats itself. 20 years, 20,000 mourners expected. And I think this will go on forever. It won't ever die down. Not for the extended family of Elvis Presley. Back live now at Graceland, you're looking at some of the fans and flowers, uh, flowers sent from around the world, places like New Zealand, Australia, Europe, Japan. Thousands of people again marching in single file tonight here at Graceland. They have nine hours to get to uh, Elvis's grave site, but there are so many people expected here tonight. The fear is that they won't get everyone in by the time gates close at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning. Mark and Allison. Thank Thanks, you, Mark. Mark. Speaking of shake, rattle, and roll. <laughs> I Little Joe and blow on Tens of thousands of fans of this man are streaming into Memphis this week to remember the king of rock and roll. 
It's hard to believe, but it will be 20 years tomorrow since the day that Elvis Presley died. But for his fans, he lives on forever. Let's go live to Memphis, where Lee Cowan is covering the gathering at Presley's Graceland Mansion. Lee. Yeah, hi, Linda. An awful lot of uh, anticipation going on here tonight. Of course, the candlelight vigil is set to begin here just in a couple of hours, but there actually have been events going on here in Memphis all week long. Some 75,000 Elvis fans are expected to pour through here for this 20th anniversary, and that just seems to be part of the Elvis story. There are more of them now than there were the day that he died. It's just part of the whole allure around Elvis. It's a story that just doesn't seem to have an ending. All over, fans are celebrating the King's life on the eve of the anniversary of his death. Elvis died back in 1977 under the specter of drug abuse brought on by the pressures of stardom. Those pressures started early, as you're about to hear from Elvis himself in this rare TV interview. Well, uh, everything has happened to me so fast in the last year and a half till uh, uh, I'm all mixed up, you know. I mean, I can't keep up with everything that's happening. That's just one of the startling insights a 21-year-old Elvis Presley makes in this rare 1956 interview from High Gardner Calling, a local New York City talk show, Hound Dog on the Steve Allen Show, when High Gardner placed a call to the young Elvis, who was smack in the middle of a frenzied schedule that allowed no time for rest. How much sleep do you get? Well, I average about four or five hours a night, I guess. Is that enough? No, well, it's really not, but I'm used to it, and uh, I can't sleep any longer. 1956 was a year of incredible highs for Elvis. His style and music was causing a cultural revolution, and this brought him the sting of angry critics, who felt Elvis had an evil influence on teenagers. I don't see that any type of a music would, would have any bad influence on people when it's only a music, I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I can't figure it out, I mean... And in a lot of the papers, I say rock and roll was a big influence on juvenile delinquency. I don't think that it is. Uh, juvenile delinquency is something that's, uh, it's, uh, well, it's it just, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but I don't see how music would have anything to do with it at all. And soon, Elvis would add movie stardom to his list of achievements. Theater goers shrieked with delight at the promise of him on the big screen. Tender. In discussing this, Elvis gave us a glimpse of not only his dreams for the future, but a modest and sincere view of his own talents. Now, if you, if you had your choice, would you prefer to be uh, an actor than to be a, a singing entertainer? Uh, if I were a good actor, of course I'm not a good singer, but uh, if I were a good actor, I think that I would like it a little better. Uh, although, uh, if I ever break into the acting uh, completely, I'll still continue. Uh, my singing, I'll still continue making records. And until his final bow, 21 years later, Elvis Presley continued the magic, a spell that has not worn off since his death 20 years ago. At Graceland, they are the hot item, the queen of dolls and the king of rock and roll. A special Barbie Loves Elvis doll set is flying off the shelves at the souvenir shop, with one being sold every two to three minutes. Of course, it's left old Bo Ken all shook up, according to Jack Soden, CEO of Elvis Presley Enterprises. And of course, I'd like to express my condolences to Ken because uh, he has to step aside now. The set costs a whopping $80, and though you can only find it at Graceland right now, the happy couple is expected at your toy store by the end of the month. Poor Ken. All right, if you're feeling spontaneous and want to make a quick trip to Graceland this weekend, Think again. Rooms are booked, and so is every hotel in a... Perhaps you're okay with high-quality imitation Elvis. I will dream. Or maybe you insist on the real thing. Whatever your tastes in Elvis might be, Memphis, Tennessee has it all. Because that's what people want, and you, you got to give the people what they want. What people here seem to want is more than a trip to Elvis's mansion, grave, and meditation garden, more than a peek at his new statue, more than a grilled peanut butter sandwich at his new restaurant. They want to keep his music alive. I don't listen to country. I don't listen to nothing else except Elvis to this day. One man who is keeping the roots of Elvis's music alive is Scotty Moore, a pioneering guitarist on Elvis's early recordings. It's such great music. You know, it just, it's, like I said, it feels good. It makes people feel good. 
Perhaps that's why 750,000 people flock to Graceland each year. It might explain other phenomena too, such as why this gentleman's back is totally tattooed with Elvis, or explain the depth of Elvis poetry readings. Elvis, 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 Elvis. Maybe this all seems a bit strange to you, but for Elvis fans, it doesn't get any better. Somebody said that if you're an Elvis, if you're not an Elvis fan, no explanation is possible. If you are an Elvis fan, no explanation is necessary. And I think that says everything. Thank you. You're fantastic. Thank you very much. And so, 20 years after, the legend only increases. As we get further away from the actual date of Elvis's death, his popularity only grows. At Graceland, Keith Oppenheim, WGN News. And if you think Elvis, Elvis, Elvis is still alive, there's a $10 million reward for anyone who can produce the king. Makers of the film get a load of this title. Elvis is alive. I swear I saw him just, I just saw him eating a ding-dong outside the Piggly Wiggly. That's the whole title. Announced the reward yesterday. The deadline to come up with the real Elvis is January 8th, 1998. You don't have much time. That would have been Elvis's 63rd birthday. Well, Julia Child, the queen of color. Band members Scotty Moore and DJ Fontana says it was all just something that came naturally to Presley. You see, he didn't himself think he was vulgar. He, he said, am I doing something wrong? No, you're not doing anything wrong. We didn't think he was vulgar at all. And he didn't think he was vulgar, so he just kept it, you know, just kept it up because the, the people liked it. When you go back and look at what he did, I'm still shocked. I still can't believe they let it on TV. Joe Ely yeah. was eight years old when he heard Elvis for the first time. When I was eight years old, I was playing the violin. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I had a little, little violin, and I was uh, learning my scales. And uh, all of a sudden, when this kind of new guitar sound came, uh, my violin bit the dirt, and uh, I traded it for electric guitar. Ely, who would go on to become a singer and a songwriter, says the impact of this new sound went a lot farther than the music. There was a whole stir among, among kids. All of a sudden, they, they wanted to be uh, a little wilder and a little freer and break away from their parents a little sooner. And uh, so there was, a, there was a kind of a, just a fever that took place, uh, which, you know, changed American radio, changed uh, all kinds of things. The anniversary of Elvis's death just a few weeks away, a recently released book is giving us a rare Elvis sighting, a lost treasure chest of Presley family photos. And I'm but we take you way back. The youngest one I think we have is 13. 13, I believe. That's with his mother. Next month marks the 20th anniversary of the death of rock and roll's only true king. Now two of Elvis Presley's cousins have brought out a book about him, rich with family anecdotes and enlivened with 150 never published photos. The pictures were discovered in an old trunk belonging to Elvis's beloved Aunt Nash. The world knows Elvis the performer, so Don and I wanted to share the real man with you and what it was like when he was younger. Their book is like pouring through a family album full of faded pictures and vivid memories. He was very close to my grandmother Dodger, and he, she was not able to get outside like, like she, should, you know, he would wanted her to. And so, if he wanted her to see the horses, he would just bring the horses into the house. <laughs> Elvis was thrilled over Lisa Marie. I mean, I, that was probably his greatest uh, triumph. He cherished her, carried her around on a pillow when she was born. Their intimate portrait of Elvis reveals secrets even many of his friends never knew. I think about the dark glasses, but you know, it, a lot of fans didn't know that he had glaucoma. As Grandma would say, mm -hmm. take those shades off. Take those shades off. Let me see those eyes. That's perfect. High cheekbones. High cheekbones. Cherokee Indian in us. Like a family Bible, the Cousins book is a history of triumph and tragedy. And like a family Bible, the book is a record of life and death. It was Aunt Nash who called almost 20 years ago, saying the girls should pray. And I thought it was Grandma Minnie. Minnie was gone. And I said, oh, is it Minnie? And she said, no, it's Elvis. And I just literally, I heard in the background Lisa Marie crying and saying, I can't wake my daddy up. In a photo, it's the shadows and the highlights that brings the, the essence of the portrait to the forefront, and it's the same way in life. 
you have your highlights and your and your shadows. The book now has a sequel titled Precious Family Memories of Elvis, a personal scrapbook. We'll be right back. Stay with us. You next on ET. He was leaning on the jukebox and he was chewing gum. Rare footage and photos of the king and the secret stories of the girl who came before Priscilla. We would kiss literally for hours. We're opening up the secret diaries of her dates with Presley. I love Elvis. She was desired by many, but fell in love with only a few. Coming up on E.T., she was in high school when she dated the king. Now she's sharing her memories of blue suede shoes and too tight slacks. He'd wear his pants so tight that he couldn't even bend down. Plus, Priscilla, while it lasted, it was the love story of its day. But Priscilla is not the only woman who can say she caught and held the king's eye. And Elvis's unknown love is not the only one of the king's secrets finally coming to light 20 years after his death. She was wearing my ring and I was wearing her ring. We were wearing each other's rings. <laughs> This is a rare look at The King in 1956, doing one of his very first television interviews. A young Wink Martindale hosted a local Memphis show called Dance Party, and these are never-before-seen photos of that momentous occasion. He told me during that interview that, you know, fads come and go, and he, he, he really didn't know how long this was going to last, this Elvis Presley mania, but he was going to ride it out to the bitter end. The interview was before Elvis hit it big, two years before he signed up for his tour of duty in the Army. Elvis came on the show to promote a local benefit concert, and from this footage, it's clear he was not yet a pro in front of the camera. He was leaning on the jukebox, and he was chewing gum, and, uh... <laughs> Very, just very, very nervous and seemingly could hardly wait until this was over and he could get out of there. Uh, I'd like to say uh, the word that, uh, uh, let's see, what would I like to say? You can do anything, off of my blue suede shoes. In the early 1960s, Elvis was living in Los Angeles and was dating 14-year-old Sandy Farah, whose father owned a hot Hollywood nightclub. He'd wear his pants so tight that he couldn't even bend down. So if he dropped something, he'd snap his fingers and one of his boys would pick it up for him because if he bent over, those britches might just rip. Sandy appeared as a dancer in a few of Elvis's films like Viva Las Vegas. The King gave her mementos like an embroidered sweatshirt, his pajama top, and a taking care of business pendant. Even though she was still in high school while she dated Elvis, she said the relationship was chaste. We would kiss literally for hours. And then when I'd go to school the next day because of his beard, I'd ha my face would be all raw. <laughs> Sandy unearthed her diary from her Elvis years and is amused by her then naivete. On days that I didn't have a date with Elvis, it says unkissed. On days that I did have a date with Elvis, it says kissed at the top. And I love Elvis. Ironically, Sandy and Wink Martindale met years later and were married. Both were surprised by their Elvis connection. Wink says he often views this old tape of his interview with the King and knows that he has his own little part of music history. It's a night that I'll never forget. I still get chills when I think about it. Well, thank you very much, Wink, and I'll see you again. Okay, thanks a lot. Mm. Wink and Sandy Martindale will be at Graceland to mark the 20th anniversary of Elvis' death. That is on August 16th. There will be seminars, candlelight ceremonies, fan conventions, and charity events in connection with the anniversary. On this man who was hired... We just had a real great relationship musically, and, and we just kicked back and relaxed and just, you know, enjoy each other's company. James Burton has picked his guitar on hundreds of albums and jammed with such greats as Jerry Lee Lewis and Bruce Springsteen. But his fondest memories are of his days and nights on the road with Elvis Presley. Our Bill McGowan has the story of The King and I. To the rest of the world, Elvis Presley was larger than life, an untouchable American icon. But James Burton knew a different Elvis. One for the month, two for the show. We just had a real great relationship musically, and, and we just kicked back and relaxed and just, you know, enjoy each, each other's company. Burton played lead guitar with Elvis until his death in 1977. And after sharing a stage with him for nine years, James Burton grew to know the man behind the crown. And life on the road sometimes proved Elvis could also double as the court jester. Elvis enjoyed playing pranks, and sometimes he was a he was a good uh, winner, but sometimes a, a 
a sore loser. But anyway, this one, one particular night, he got a water gun, had a water gun on stage, stuck in his belt. Nobody knew about it. So he went over to, when he started introducing the band, he pulled his water gun out and started shooting everybody. And just, everybody just went nuts. And although he may have been the king, no one was above retaliation by the boys in the band. So we all got together and had a little meeting, and Joe said, you know, he moves around the stage a lot. Why don't we just get some marbles, 10,000 marbles, and just put them all over the stage? So the second show, Elvis came out. All these marbles, the curtain went up and all these marbles, he went out and we were playing the opening music and it was amazing. All these marbles and Elvis is trying to get through the stage without falling on, you know, with these marbles. I mean, it's pretty dangerous, really. James was more than Elvis's main man. He made his network debut as a teenager with heartthrob Ricky Nelson. I knew there is. We never part, so hello. He went on to fan the flames behind superstars like Jerry Lee Lewis. And he grew up to duel six strings with the boss. But it was somewhere in between, when he stood guard beside the king, that James Everybody Burton became immortalized in the minds of fans. That's Polk. Solid. We used to call him Squirrely on stage because he, you know, he, he was all, he never stayed in one place very long. So uh, this watch, uh, he gave gave me this watch, and on the back of the watch it says to James from Squirrely EP. He was such an idol for so many people, and uh, for me it was just like. Uh, I mean, he was just like one of the guys. Even if you've never noticed, James, the songs wouldn't be the same without him or his now infamous Pink Paisley guitar. I hesitated for about three or four days uh, before I played it with Elvis. It was so bright. But when I took it on stage and played, I thought I would just go ahead and surprise him one night, and I did. He loved it. I had to play it ever since. It has become as much of an Elvis trademark as his taking care of business logo. Uh, when I walked backstage one night between shows, uh, he had one for me and he said, here, James, this is for you. And he put it around my neck. And uh, boy, it was, a, it was a great feeling, you know, because it was something that, that he was very proud to do with certain members. And uh, because they were family to him. And it made me feel good to know that I was accepted. The gold records and piles of music awards which line his mantle are a hint at just how accepted James Burton has become. He's lost track of exactly how many albums he's played on, but estimates the count at somewhere around 400. And no matter who he's playing behind, they usually take a back seat when James begins to jam. Yo, James. When he's not on the road with John Denver, you can usually find James floating around Louisiana, where this hometown boy even has a day named in his honor. And most Shreveport residents will give you a good argument as to who the real king is. But when it comes to loyalty and legends, James's heart doesn't mind playing second string, as long as Elvis is center stage. I had a real special thing about Elvis in my heart. And, uh... I miss, even today, I miss his music. It's all music I love. It's music I love playing, and it, it, it'll be here until uh, till after I'm gone. It'll live forever. It's great.